our next speakers. Um, we have Ramiro and Niels. And uh, about two years ago at the CCC camp, Ramiro told us about how to hack microcontrollers cheaply with an Arduino and similar electronics. Now he and Niels are going to present the topic of Niels' master thesis. They are both security analysts, and they have turned their attention towards cars and towards all the little microcontrollers and all the electronics inside it. And they will show us why even a car that's where the code is coded to safety standards isn't necessarily secure. So please give a big warm welcome to Ramiro and Niels. Uh, thanks. Thanks, everybody, for being here. Uh, in the next 45 minutes, more or less, we'll talk about uh, automotive microcontroller security. So first, we will introduce uh, a little bit what is full injection. We will introduce uh, what is the standards for automotive uh, security. Uh, we'll explain uh, a specific experiments we run on these microcontrollers and how we break uh, can we break JTAG in these microcontrollers? And finally, we will do some recommendations about uh, how to prevent these attacks. So first, let, us, uh, let me introduce ourselves. I am Ramiro. I am security analyst, senior security analyst, and my colleague is Niels. Maybe Niels, you can move there so they can see you on the screen. <laughs> we work uh, at Riskier, which is a a small hardware security lab. We are specialized in hardware. We sell tools for hacking hardware, and we also uh, sell services, evaluations for embedded systems and, and chips. We have a lot of experience in uh, many markets, uh, smart cards, uh, embedded systems, uh, payment. And in the maybe last two years, we also focus on automotive. So when we came into this industry, or we started to work with this industry, we found the following. So this is what most of the people is doing, or other, yeah, other analysts or other hackers are working on. So they are working on uh, the services online, or the connectivity between the car and the services, or the car gateway, the buses, the CAM buses. And at the lowest level, some of them are working at the ECU. So a ECU uh, is the computer in the car. Maybe you know about these hacks, the Jeep hack. Uh, I guess that everybody knows this. Maybe you know about Tesla recently also has been hacked a few times in the past. Uh, the Nissan, um, Mitsubishi, uh, this was hacked with the application. So probably you know my, many more examples than this. Uh, I think that uh, in the DEF CON the past week, they saw with, uh, another attack on another car. So there are many of these. So a lot of people is working on these layers, especially in the communication between these layers. But we are focusing on what we are better in the lowest level of the hardware. So we are focusing on attacking the uh, car from the microcontroller. Uh, this normally means side channel attacks and fall injecting attacks, which I don't know if you are familiar with this. So in case you are not familiar, I will explain what is fall injection. So when you design an uh, embedded system, you choose a chip, a microcontroller, and then you go to the data set. And normally you find something like this. Like, you can operate this microcontroller between 1.88 volts and 5.5. If you uh, operate at lower uh, voltage or higher voltage, they tell you that it's not safe, but they don't tell you really what is going to happen. But we can imagine that if we run for a long time about 5.5 volts, uh, which is the limit in this microcontroller, for example, or below 1.8, we can imagine, we can guess, that uh, probably if we run about 5.5 volts, uh, we will have fire. The, the, the chip is going to burn, probably. And if we uh, run below 1.8, the chip is going not to work. It's just going to sleep. It's not powered. But the question is, what happens if we have something like this? So we uh, operate the microcontroller or the chip for just a few 
nanoseconds or microseconds above or under the, the range of recommended uh, or the safe range of, uh, of voltage. So when this happens, this is, what we, uh, this is what we call a glitch. We have a glitch. Normally what happens is that because this signal, uh, the, the glitch, the power peak is, uh, is transferred or is uh, distributed uh, across the, the, the chip in a different way, uh, certain IPs or certain hardware blocks will be affected by the glitch and certain will not. So for example, we affect the CPU and for few clock cycles the CPU will not work, but the rest of the chip will work. So it can uh, be that uh, the encryption model is still working all the way around. So when we do these glitches, normally we have this kind of effects. We can have uh, bits that flips. So we have in the memory or in registers, we have zeros and then they flip to ones, or we have ones, and they flip to zeros. We can uh, prevent accesses uh, to memories. So for example, uh, the CPU tries to access to an internal SRAM or to an internal register. Uh, and then with a glitch, you prevent the access. You make the logic to access to the memory to fail. And then you return, you get zeros, or you don't write whatever you wanted to write in the memory. We can skip instructions. So we have a CPU, and it's running a set of instructions. And then we inject a glitch in just one specific point, that point, uh, the instruction that is running that point, probably will not be executed, will be just skip. We can, uh, sometimes we can disable modules. So we inject a glitch and a hardware module just will fail, JITAG or will be, I don't know, encryption or whatever. And sometimes we have a uh, chip destruction. So we inject a glitch, we for even for a few nanoseconds or microseconds, we have uh, a stress of voltage. It happens that maybe an internal uh, trace of the power uh, within the chip will be fused, we will burn. So this can happen. So uh, in order to understand better uh, what is FI, uh, full injection, I will let my, my colleague Niels to do a demo. Okay, so now to show you that it actually works, I have a small setup to demonstrate what fault injection can do. <coughs> and I have a camera here to show you what I have on the table. So what I'm attacking is this small Arduino Nano. Uh, it, it communicates over UART through these cables here. And the power comes through these two cables here. And if we follow the power, it goes through this amplifier, which increases the amps, because the tool that actually sends the power signal does not provide enough amps. And this power line will be glitched, like we saw in the few slides ago. Uh, now we need to figure out when we have to do this glitch. And for this, we monitor the UART communication coming out here which goes into this GPIO pin and it uh, watches for a certain UART pattern. And when that pattern happens, this through this cable, a glitch, uh, a trigger signal goes from uh, one core to the other core. Because this little box here, Spider, is one of our in-house tools. And it is, it contains two cores, Spider core one and two. And Spider Core 2 can uh, sniff uh, data, and then using the GPIO pins here, we send the signal to the other Spider Core. Uh, on this Arduino, there's a small piece of code running from a, uh, har uh, a hardware capture the flag that we were running last year called Risk Your Hack Me. And this is one of the challenges from that uh, capture the flag. So what it does is it prints uh, as an initial message that says uh, level one, and then it goes into an infinite loop here, which will print lock all the time. And now you have to exit this loop in order to obtain the flag in this uh, final lines of code. Uh, and this code is running right now on the target. 
which I will show you in this terminal. So you can see here the log message going on and on and on. And if I reset, I get this level one message and then chip status lock, 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 lock. And now the goal is to use fault injection on this loop here. And then we go out of this loop and we try to get the flag that's hidden here. So for this, I have a small Python script to control the spider. Uh, here's some setup, blah, 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 blah. And this is where we I program the trigger on UART on the pattern lock. And then here, we wait for this trigger. And when we see the trigger, we do a glitch, which is the short drop in uh, power that uh, we called the glitch before. So this will run with, uh, will run not. Okay, so now it tries various parameters for this glitch to try and find uh, parameters for which the, the glitch causes a fault. And that fault should contain the flag message uh, in its output. So here we see a bunch of attempts being made. And depending on how difficult your target is, this can take days or weeks or minutes. In this case, the target is not that complicated, so if we leave this running for about an hour, we will start seeing a bunch of successful glitches. Uh, for this demo, I have some parameters that will do that a little quicker that I already found, which I will run now. And now you can see in the output that we get this flag message that we were looking for. And uh, that's fault injection. Okay. Uh, one comment, we did the demo with our own hardware, but uh, you can do the same with just very cheap hardware. You can just spend 20 euros and uh, have a setup to do exactly the same. Uh, actually, my colleagues here are going to think to today or tomorrow to do some demonstrations uh, how to use cheap hardware to do this kind of attacks. If you are interested, just come to our village, uh, Rescue, Rescue Fefe, uh, and then you can, we can show you. Okay, so... Uh, we see that if we, in this case, we were dropping the voltage. It was drop voltage, right? We were dropping the voltage below the recommended, and we were having these glitches. We could also go higher, and probably we would get also glitches. But uh, we can also do more things. So, for example, we can just try to play in this area, which is not recommended, so uh, operate at higher speed, this microcontroller, and uh, with a voltage which is not in the safe area, and then we will have glitches. But basically, if we go to the data set uh, of the microcontroller and we find specifications that the data set recommends you not to uh, see it, uh, that's an interesting point to do a glitch. So for example, this is the data set of this device. Oh, sorry. Sorry, uh, back. Yes. Exceeding these specifications will pr produce a glitch always that you exceed it in a very short period of time. If we go through the data set, for example, we find this specification for clock. And this is very interesting. Here they tell you that uh, you cannot have between 
two periods, clock periods, you cannot have a difference bigger than 2% of the period. What happens if you see it? They don't tell you. What will happen is that you have a glitch, a clock glitch. The same with the reset. They tell you in the data sheet that what is the voltage for the reset and what is the minimum pulse width of the reset. If you have a reset which is smaller than uh, 2.5 microseconds, what happens? They will not tell you, but you will have a, a glitch. So we have different techniques to do glitching. Uh, we have voltage glitching, uh, which is the one we saw here by changing the, very quickly the, the, the power of the, of, the, of the device. We have clock glitching, reset glitching, and then we have fancy ways of doing glitching, which is an electromagnetic uh, fall injection. We use a coil uh, that generates an EM uh, pulse to affect a specific areas of the chip. So we want only to affect, for example, the crypto hardware. So then we put this coil uh, on the surface of the chip, just wherever is the, the crypto hardware, and we inject a pulse, a EM pulse. And then it will create a glitch in, the, in this IP, only, only the IP we are targeting. Or we can use lasers. We can decap the chip, remove the, the packets of the chip, and then we inject uh, photons with the laser to affect gates. So we can literally chain bits uh, using this technique. Then you can also play with the temperature, <coughs> but the problem is that you cannot do it very quickly. You cannot, uh, if the chip is operating at a uh, room temperature, you cannot uh, set it very high very quickly and then drop it again. So we use this morely, mostly for, um, by raising the temperature, you can make the chip more sensitive to other glitches. So uh, any of these previous uh, techniques, uh, I mentioned it, will have similar effects, all these effects. So you might think that this is not very common attack, or that this is not very useful, that uh, right now there is not many examples on live on, on, on the wheel that uh, will use these techniques, these hardware techniques. But the thing is that many industries have been dealing with this problem for many years, and maybe you're not even aware of that. So maybe you know this. The Xbox, the chip for the Xbox, was a reset glitch. Uh, you, could, you could hack the Xbox by putting a, a specific circuit which was glitching the reset line of the, of the, no, sorry, the power, yeah, the reset line of the Xbox. The same with the Nintendo Wii. This one was doing a power glitch on the voltage of the CPU. This is a Wasabi chip, I think. And if we go back in the time, I think it's the first reference I heard of uh, using a glitching for breaking a, a, a game station a console. Uh, the old NES, there was a way to break the, the anti-copy protection uh, in the card rights in the, in, the, in the games by using power glitch on a, a secure a CPU or secure chip that they have. Uh, and maybe this is the ultimate uh, AIDS test. Anybody? Anybody knows the relation between these two? <laughs> yeah. OK, you are too old, yes. OK, uh, yeah, so I don't know, uh, but uh, I remember when I was a kid, you could go to one of these uh, arcade machines and use the, the piezoelectric for a, of a, of, um, a lighter and this will uh, generate a, a spark that will confuse the, the coin, uh, the, the, the electronics that uh, detect the coin, and will give you credits for free. So uh, still, this trick is uh, working. So there is some people that is doing it. This is a video from YouTube. They are not using a coil, uh, sorry, uh, a lighter. They are using something more sophisticated. It's creating electromagnetic pulse. See the screen? Yeah. 
I wonder if you can overflow it. Uh, okay, let's stop it. So, uh, games industry has have been dealing with this uh, problem for many years, but probably the industry that have been dealing with this problem for longer is uh, smart cards. So this, for example, is um, maybe you know you heard about this. This is called Unlooper. Unlooper. This device at, at the right. Uh, it was used in the around the year 2000 to um, protect uh, to glitch smart cards and protect them, so you could watch uh, pay TV for free. So this was uh, used 17 years ago. The good news is that we have some techniques to prevent these kind of attacks. We can use software and we can use hardware to prevent. So we can design, we can code uh, the software in a way that is uh, more secure against uh, these kind of fall injecting attacks. Normally, these techniques uh, are based on checking things twice. So, for example, if you are checking a password, so you check first time, and then you check a second time. Maybe they inject a glitch in the, the first time you, you were checking the password, but then you have a second uh, check that will detect if there is any error and will not allow you to access to the, to the system. So there are different techniques for, for software, software techniques, and there is also a lot of techniques for hardware. So chip manufacturers can do something at hardware level to prevent uh, glitches. Uh, smart card manufacturers and uh, secure socks, secure chips manufacturers have been implementing these uh, countermeasures uh, for many years now. One of the most common, or the two most common uh, countermeasures are monitoring the signals, so detecting any glitch, any peak in the power or in the clock or in the reset, and uh, adding redundancy. So uh, those modules that are important or are critical for the security of the chip, they duplicate it and they run in parallel. So maybe a glitch will, infect, uh, will affect one of the modules, but not the other. So by running in parallel, you have more chances of uh, detecting the glitch. So when uh, we started to work or to, to research in the automotive uh, market, we already have a lot of experience in other segments or in other markets. And uh, we tried to, to find or to assess what was the, the security level in automotive for against this kind of attacks, fall injecting on side channel. Then the first thing we did is try to find a standards against uh, a standard that defines some kind of uh, countermeasures or uh, regulations against this kind of attacks. The problem is that there is no standards. The closest thing is the ISO 2626 which is not a security standard, it's a safety standard. So is this standard regulates what happens if uh, there is a problem in your chip, in the chip that is in your car. So because the chips in the cars operate uh, in a very noisy environment, there is a lot of noise because the engine, uh, or because, yeah, the, the engine, the sparks from the, from the, um, uh, what's the name, the, the coils? I don't know the English word, the, the sparks for the engine. Uh, they introduce a lot of noise in the power of the, of the of ECUs, of the computers in the, in the car. Uh, there is a lot of uh, regulations to prevent the chips to crash. So in this standard, ISO 2626 too, they talk about fall injection, but as a technique to test if your chip is uh, safe against this noise in normal operation uh, of the engine or the, well, or the car, the, the, the ECU. This standard defines the ACL, Automotive Safety Integrity Level. So this basically is uh, a level which is given to devices based on uh, the risk, the exposure to a risk, how is it to control the risk, uh, and the severity of the risk, and then you will get uh, a level which can be from A to D. Being A, the chips or, well, or the systems that are less safe and these is more safe systems in an automotive uh, or in a car. There is also a QM level, which uh, is only given to devices that have no special uh, mechanism to prevent uh, against uh, anything, basically. So QM is just uh, normal chips. 
So we took a look at this ACLD safety mechanism that these automotive uh, microcontrollers have, and then we found the following, that they implement these two mechanisms to prevent errors in the chip. So one is the CPU lockstep, so two CPUs run the same code at the same time, only that they are um, uh, separated by a number of uh, clock cycles. So if there is a problem, because, I don't know, gamma ray or because uh, noise coming from the, from the engine, whatever, maybe one CPU cannot execute properly the instruction, but the second CPU will. So the two CPUs are running in parallel, and they are comparing the output of the execution to see if there is the same. If it's not the same, there will be an interruption, and there will be some kind of routine that uh, stops uh, in a safe way the car or whatever. And we also found that there is a lot of uh, redundancy in memories. So many memories are re uh, redundant. So um, this way, you can uh, inject a glitch in one of the memories, flip one of the bits uh, in the memory, but not uh, the other. So these mechanisms are very similar to those that we found uh, or we find in uh, full injection protected uh, chips, so smart cars, for example. So we were wondering. We know ISO 2626 is about safety. Can be also used as, a, as security. Can be also protect uh, this standard against full injection techniques, because this is something that many people think. Many people think that the Locks, uh, the, the lockstep in the CPUs will prevent uh, fall injection to, 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 to succeed in these this chips. So this is the research we did. Nils? Yes, so this is where the experiments of my master thesis come in. So to investigate how effective these particular countermeasures are that we find in the uh, automotive targeted microcontrollers, we took three chips, uh, two that fall on the ACLD spectrum and one that falls all the way on the other side on the QM spectrum. So these two, the red and the blue chip, will have uh, these particular countermeasures, so lockstep and parity checks, to prevent faults. And they also use various degrees of architecture. So these two have the bottom two have uh, ARM. Uh, use the ARM architecture and the blue one uses PowerPC, which are the two most common architectures found in uh, the automotive world. Uh, then we took two techniques from the techniques that were just listed. We took voltage glitching that I demonstrated, and we also had a look at uh, electromagnetic glitching. And the nice thing about electromagnetic glitching is that you can localize your uh, glitch more than with voltage. In voltage, you affect the entire power plane that you are glitching, while with EM, you can sort of target your uh, glitch to a specific point on the chip. It's not as precise as a laser, of course, but it is still a nice upside. The downside here is that you also in addition to finding uh, when to glitch and how hard to glitch, you now also have to find where to glitch. So the initial thing we found in our experiments is that we could not successfully glitch uh, the blue target with EM, uh, with voltage. So this was only glitched with EM. And the other two targets, we could do both. Uh, then we did two kinds of experiments. First, we did characterization experiments, which are very simple <coughs> snippets of code that was also similar to the snippet of code that was running on the Arduino that we just glitched. And the purpose of this is to find out if you can um, uh, successfully inject faults in your target at all. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, nicest characterization experiments we did here is where you simulate the behavior that happens when some authentication happens and the result of that is stored in a flag. And in this case, we just set it to one. And then if the flag is equal to zero, we are authenticated. And otherwise, we are not authenticated. And yeah, you see here that the branch that says not authenticated should happen because flag is not zero. 
And what you can do with fault injection here, it's better to see if we switch to assembly uh, to an assembly view of this code. So you will get a load flag instruction, then you will get a compare instruction, uh, then based on uh, the compare, we will branch to a certain line in our uh, instruction set. In this case, we will go to the uh, not authenticated uh, line and continue. So if we just change this one red bit from one to zero, all of a sudden our branch instruction changes to a store instruction, which if it does not uh, corrupt our uh, execution flow in such a way that the system outright crashes, will mean that effectively we have just erased this if check and we are now authenticated. So any fancy authentication, crypto stuff, you can just bypass it afterwards. So we did these, uh, we did these characterization experiments on uh, the targets and then what we have left with, we are left uh, with finding is when uh, exactly this if check happens and uh, how hard we have to glitch to affect uh, the amount of the, the bits that we want. So in order to do this, we first we look at what happens in normal behavior. Uh, and from that, we determine windows where we expect that, uh, that glitches might be successful. And then we just start shooting that for a day or two. And we start plotting them in uh, nice graphs to identify where sensitive <laughs> areas are. So first you will see some green spots, which means nothing happened. And then you will also see uh, yellow spots, which means that the target either died or reset. So we are glitching too hard in the yellow case, but not hard enough in the green case. And then when, if you, are so if you uh, set up your experiment correctly, you also start seeing successful glitches. And that's indicated by this red dot in this particular plot. And uh, then we have one additional category, which is this uh, pink on the left, which means that the glitch was uh, detected by the countermeasures present in the targets. And then when you run this overnight, you do uh, 100, 200, 300,000 attempts, and then you start getting these nice graphs where you can see that if you are glitching hard enough, but not too hard, then if you go into that sweet spot, you will have successful glitches which in this case are not detected, which was a surprising result. So in this particular case, uh, about 25% of the attempts were detected. And if we uh, look into the registers of the target, we see that over 90% of these detections uh, uh, originate from the lockstep mechanism, so where you have two cores doing the same thing. And... Um, then a smaller amount uh, is because of the parity checks that are in place. Uh, yeah, just to throw some numbers at you. If we find very specific uh, fixed parameters for our ideal glitch, we are able to glitch the simple target all the time. We are successful with our more ASLD targets around 60% of the time. So for us, this confirmed that Safety is not the same as security, at least according to this standard. No, just a single fault. The question was, do we need two glitches? And the answer is no, we only have one glitch to do uh, this. Why? Why? That's a good question. <laughs> we, we have we some theories about that. We, yeah, we, were, expecting to have a, we were expecting to have a two glitches, to need two glitches for affecting both CPUs, but we found that one single glitch is enough. And then we have uh, two theories. Uh, one is that uh, we are affecting the, the, the flash, so uh, the flash path. Uh, we are basically glitching before we are going here, so here somewhere. And the second theory is that because uh, this is an ARM core, uh, ARM uh, Air 4, I think, uh, it has seven stages pipeline, I think it was seven stages pipeline. Yeah. So maybe because the pipeline, uh, seven stages, needs each instruction needs seven clock cycles. 
the CPU lock step is separated for two clock cycles, if we inject a glitch, we are actually affecting the same instruction but in different states. So maybe the first, instruct, maybe the first core we affect during the fetching, and the second core we affect during the execution. So it's still, we found this but quite surprising to, to be honest. We were expecting to have uh, to need double glitch. Yeah. Yeah, but we don't have detailed uh, documentation and views into these targets, so it's very hard to determine exactly what happens. Okay, so now that we know that we can uh, successfully inject faults at our targets, we wanted to do something more uh, meaningful. And for this, we chose to attack the, de the locking mechanisms in these targets that lock the JTAG down. And people, uh, yeah, you want to lock your JTAG when you put your uh, chips out in the field so, you, so people can't just extract uh, confidential firmware or valuable uh, intellectual property. And from a more academic point of view, this is also interesting because before we knew what was running roughly, so we can make guesses about where we have to in inject our fault. And all these locking mechanisms happen in hardware or in ROM code that we don't have access to. So now we are basically, we have no idea where we have to glitch. So we need to, be s we need to find other techniques to investigate <laughs> where we need to do our fault injection. Uh, for this, we resorted to uh, side channel analysis because by looking at the power consumption of a target in a locked uh, target and in an unlocked target and then comparing the two uh, power traces, we thought, well, maybe we'll see a difference and that's likely where the JTAG is being locked and we, if we f uh, do fault injection on that point, uh, we will either keep the target in an unlocked state or unlock it. So, yes, what, what we do here, we take our power measurement, we see that we have power on, power off, but we still have no idea what's happening in the middle. And that's why we look at an unlocked and a locked version. So for the first target, we have, you see here, a, a brown line and a blue line. And that's, those lines represent the locked and the unlocked uh, power trace. And when here we see a very clear difference at this point. So here we do fault injection, and we were able to uh, keep the JTAG unlocked. Uh, sorry, just to clarify, what we did is just we run. So from the data set, we knew that uh, somehow the JTAG lock is uh, being set up during the boot process of the chip. So we run um, the chip, uh, unlock it, unlock it. So we have this chip. Uh, we both have development, development board. And then we program this board, uh, one board with the, with the JTAG lock and the other board without the JTAG lock. And then we were uh, acquiring with a scope the, the boot up process and we compared with both, with both uh, boot up process. And we found a place where the power signal was different and we were assuming that because the only thing that changed from one uh, board to the other is the JTAG lock, we assume that this is the point where the JTAG is configured. So what happens if we glitch here? Yes, thanks for clarifying that. Uh, we did the same on the other target, and we found a similar pattern that if we configure more or less configurations for JTAG, we see a clear difference in how much power is consumed at this point, and we do a fault injection here. And again, we were able to keep it open. Uh, the success rates are slightly lower than for the characterization. <coughs> so if we do we start again with broad parameters, we narrow them down to what we find to be the optimal parameters. And in, uh, yeah, you see the percentages here. The simple target was uh, very trivially unlockable. However, the ACLD targets were slightly harder. We need around 100 attempts to get one uh, unlocked uh, attempt. Also, before, we were able to completely bypass all the uh, detection mechanisms. And in this case, we were not able to do this. Uh, around 3% of the attempts were detected, which means that if these detections are handled in a smart way, you might brick a few devices before you are actually able to unlock one. However, when you see the difference between 1% and 3%, it means yeah, you might kill 3 out of 100, but 1 in 100 will be successful. So if you just buy 10, you'll be fine. 
And now my colleague will explain some of the consequences of what... Okay, so we proved that uh, using glitches in these ACLD automotive uh, socks, microcontrollers, we can change uh, the flow of the, of the program. And with this technique, we were able to, to unlock the JITAG. So what are the consequences of this? So the most obvious one is that we can unlock the JITAG, we can uh, steal the IP in the, in the ECU, in the microcontroller. Let's imagine, for example, there is a lot of companies which is putting a lot of money in researching uh, autopilot for cars, and uh, a competitor can take this uh, ECU that do the autopilot, uh, break the JITAG, and extract the IP, which will, will help them to develop their own uh, autopilot uh, for the, the car. So this is an example of what can happen. But if you dump, the, you dump the, the software, then you can also try to reverse to reverse this software, this binary, and use it to find vulnerabilities. These vulnerabilities can be uh, remote. So if you dump, I don't know, the telemetrics, uh, uh, the telematic module, or the module in the car that connects to web services, you can dump the, the firmware, reverse, and then try to find uh, a buffer flow or something that you can exploit remotely. Uh, you can also try to find keys. So many of these uh, this these ECUs have some keys, for example, for the remote, uh, uh, the remote uh, to open the doors, or for the OTAs for updating the, the firmware of the car uh, remotely. So there is some keys, so you can try to reverse them. So for example, we are interested in the UDS keys, which are the ones that are used to, when, um, to update the firmware using the ODB2 uh, um, port, uh, the on-the-fly uh, on the air uh, update uh, keys, the remote, and the mobilizer, of course. So to, to prevent the car to be stolen, uh, there are some keys. Uh, maybe you remember this. Last year, Flavio uh, did a dem demonstration in Usenix, uh, I think it was, in Usenix. Uh, he was able to dump the firmware from uh, a remote uh, sorry, for not, not from a remote, it's from an ECU. Uh, the ECU in the Volkswagen car that controls the remote. He was able to dump the firmware, he reversed the firmware, and he found that in some cases the key is shared, uh, and all the cars use the, sa the same key. In other cases, the key is derived in a very simple way. So he was able to unlock almost all the Volkswagen cars. So this is an example of what can happen with this. If you can unlock the JITA and then extract the firmware, you can use it to find more exploits or more vulnerabilities. And uh, maybe less obvious, something that you can do also if you open the JTAG is to modify the firmware. This can be useful for tuning. There is a lot of people that have been doing this for many years uh, to add more power to the, to the cars or to change different things in the cars. But this can also be used for sabotage. Let's imagine that, I don't know, somebody wants to kill a person. In the past, you cut the, the brake uh, fluid uh, cable. Now you can just break the JTAG, update a new firmware, and then make the car to collide uh, or to crash uh, when it's uh, 120 kilometers per hour. So this is a possible scenario. And nobody will find any sabotage evidence because it's in the firmware. So uh, what can we do? There are some things we can do. The first and most obvious is to add countermeasures. There is things that you can do at hardware level and software level. So even in the system that are already deployed using the current chips, you can use software to mi minimize the risk or to mitigate a little bit the risk. Uh, but the most important thing is maybe that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. So there is already a lot of solutions out there. Smart cars manufacturers have been dealing with this problem for many years. So if you go to uh, internet and you search you Google, you will find a lot of papers out of papers uh, talking about different countermeasures against uh, fall injection. So you don't need to do nothing fancy, you can just only see what is people doing already there. And um, a specific recommendation is that we found that uh, many times we were trying to inject a glitch. <coughs> the, the glitch was uh, successful, meaning that we were able to bypass the security uh, mechanism we were trying to bypass. But um, the chip detected that something was wrong. So there is a, um, some register that indicates if the chip detects some kind of glitch or some kind of something that is wrong. So it's very tempting if it has a programmer 
to just ignore this. So make a software that there is that you, your chip says that there is something wrong, and you don't process this interruption to, to I don't know to stop the chip. It's very tempting to do that, but if you do that, maybe somebody is trying to do fall injection and uh, disabling one of the safety mechanisms. Yeah, uh, now we are doing more research, continuing this this uh, this line of uh, or this uh, this topic. Uh, we are trying to. Uh, find of all the CVT mechanisms in these chips, which ones are better to prevent glitches. And we are trying to, to apply this, uh, these attacks on real ECUs and real cars. Because all this we were doing in a development board for these chips. So we were not really attacking a real ECU. We were just buying these development boards and then trying, because it was easy for us. So now we are trying with real ECUs. And finally, we have a specific uh, obsession, let's call it, with a UDS, uh, which is a protocol uh, in the car. We are trying to break this protocol using full injection. Thanks God, there is now uh, some uh, standards that has, they are being defined right now. Uh, the 3061, J3061, and uh, 3101, these standards should address this problem. Actually, the 3061, the first part, part of this standard, is already uh, there. Uh, and they talk about side channel, uh, they talk about full injection. But they talk, it, uh, they talk about this like very, yeah, very, in a very superficial way. In theory, or I expect that uh, when they elaborate the next parts of this standard, the part two, part three, they will talk with more detail about what do you have to uh, protect uh, for against fall injection side channel. Actually, this standard defines A C S I E L, uh, so the like the the A C L uh, levels, but for cyber security. And this 3101 should also address these problems, but this one is uh, uh, is still working in, so we don't know what is in there. So maybe in the future, there will be some standards and some protecting against these fall injection techniques. Oh, no, sorry, this one. If you want to know more details about this research, we will publish a full paper in the FDTC uh, 2017. Uh, this is uh, next month in September. You will be able to download the paper with more details. Uh, I know that this full injection on the side channel is very, I don't know, confusing or is very abstract. So if you are interested in knowing more details, Tomorrow, uh, our colleagues will talk about how to use against fall injection to bypass secure boot. And I think it's a phone. I don't know what, what is the target tomorrow. And we have in our village, we have some demos and workshops about uh, fall injection and side channels. So you can come and visit us. At 5, uh, we will have a demo on uh, side channel, how to use open software tools for doing side channel, if you're interested in that. Sorry? It's in, the, in our... Uh Tent is called Risku Fefe, and it's next to the Spanish uh, uh, Spanish uh, hacker space. Uh, and where is this Spanish the Spanish hacker space? <laughs> uh, it's in the Hopper field. Just you can try to find us in the weekend. Yeah. So, any question? Ah, yeah. Uh, sorry, I forgot something. Uh, Actually, I forgot something. I guess. Yeah, I forgot something. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you forgot something. I yes. <laughs> so I demonstrated this uh, uh, this fault injection on this small Arduino, which was part of a capture the flag challenge we were running last year, which is called the uh, Risk Your Hack Me. And we are now in our third edition, which goes live on Monday. So if you are in if you are interested in uh, doing more hardware-oriented uh, capture the flag style challenges, you should definitely register. And we also added some automotive components. <laughs> and we are working with the company Argus Cybersecurity to make uh, automotive specific capture the flag challenges as well. So if you are interested in hardware security, full injection side channel and uh, automotive uh, hacking, then uh, you should sign up for this. We will send you a board if you qualify by passing some challenges. We will send you a board with uh, uh, some challenges you have to hack. And that's it. Um, any question? Thank you. Thank you very much. Very interesting talk. 
just another thing that I need to try out the next weekend. So we now have about 12 minutes left for a Q&A session. Um, please line up on the microphones in the middle. And I see there's one question already. Hey there, thanks for this great introduction to the topic and uh, demos. I have a question about the ASL standard. Why did you choose the colors? I wonder that you gave for the best co class the red color. I would give the green one, but why give it the red one? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I guess that. Uh, well, do you have an excuse? I'm uh, sorry. The development board is red, so. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hi. How likely do you think it is that uh, the development board doesn't have any protection against? Uh, stopping the, this kind of injections, because you know, in the end, it's only that. Whereas they, when they actually deploy it, they will detect intrusions and say, OK, after three intrusions, you're done. Yeah, uh, we tested the safety mechanism or the security mechanism in the chip, within the chip. Because it's in the chip, this development board uh, uh, yeah, have those. Of course, manufacturers can put uh, more mechanisms, detection mechanisms in the, in the the entire uh, system in the, in the PCV, they can put more detecting mechanisms. But the thing is that you can always remove from the board uh, the chip and test it in your development board. So you remove any of these mechanisms. In, other, in, in our experience, uh, we normally have to modify a little bit these PCV boards because um, the capacitors uh, in the BCC line, in the power line, um, filter the glitches. So we always have to do a small modifications in the board. So we will have to do the same. In, we will have to do the same for this uh, real ECUs. But I don't expect any kind of safety mechanism in the, in the ECU hardware that we cannot bypass by just removing the chip and putting in a different development board. Any more questions? Please line up. Yeah, one more. Did you kill some of your devices while testing? I think one died because yeah. of the EM, but that's that's it. Uh, and we put and we put one in acid to see the yeah, to see how it was inside. Yeah, yeah, that definitely didn't work anymore. Yeah, <laughs> thanks. <coughs> yes, please. How much of a problem is it actually to access um, the memory via JTAG? Because usually, I think um, in my experience, in larger boards, um, the the memory is usually externally, so what can you actually do with a Jake tag that you can't just do by <coughs> desoldering the flash or uh, whatever? This uh, are, is a microcontroller, not a microprocessor. So normally when you have a microprocessor, the memory is outside. Uh, the microcontroller, normally the memory is inside. So of course, if this is a microprocessor, you can just tap directly the lines uh, that go out of the, of the chip. And then you don't need to do all this. You don't need to open the JTAG to get the, the firmware. But in this case, in microcontroller, the firmware is inside the chip. You need to open the JTAG in order to read it. I, I believe that normally, when they have external memory, they encrypt it. And yes. they only decrypt it once it's back into the controller. Yeah, that's true. Uh, some security features are quite common in, a, in some microcontrollers, or micro microprocessors, sorry. Those that implement Secure Boot, normally they have encrypted uh, flash and sometimes encrypted uh, DDR. That's absolutely true. And then in that case, you can also use the JTAG to open it and then uh, get the decrypted uh, firmware. Yeah. One more question? Or? OK, uh, this is OK. Um, a lot of microcontrollers now come with uh, encryption engines to make things possible uh, quite quickly on the chip. Have you tried to focus attacks on that area of the die using EM or maybe laser or other techniques to see if, uh, if you could do something with that? Uh, of course, this is actually part of our, our work. Uh, there is a specific technique called differential fall analysis, where you use a glitch to affect uh, the last stages of the, of the crypto engine. And then by injecting different errors, you get different outputs, but with the same key. And then you can, by comparing them, you can extract the key without knowing which one is the key. So if you're interested in that, yes, maybe the guy in front of me can give you a lot of uh, explanation about this. Uh, thank you very much. Welcome. If there are no more questions, if there are more, please line up. Um, I have one question. Yeah. So lots of microcontrollers, I think almost all of them, come with multiple supply pins. Have you tried how much different 
happens is my, it makes if you just glitch one or a few of these supply pins to affect special areas of the chip. Uh, that's, that's correct. So sometimes these different pins are uh, powering different pow internal power plants. So one is for the analog electronics, the other is for the, uh, maybe the CPU, a different one is for the CAN transceiver. So we've, the first thing we have to figure out is which one is the one that um, the CPU uh, is running from and then we only inject the glitz in that. But many times in the documentation, you don't know, because the documentation only says VCC. So then we don't care. We just try all. So it will be less focalized uh, or less specific glitz, because it might affect many things that we are not interested. But at some point, this is a game of, game of, uh, of um, uh, statistics, let's say. We try one million times for full injection attacks, uh, and then maybe one will work. And because you have one single, uh, one single glitch will be enough to unlock the JTAG and extract the firmware. So, cool. So, oh, I see one more question. When you do such an injection, when you do such an injection, how long does one injection take? Is it milliseconds, one second? No, uh, it depends from target to target. So normally it's often, often uh, is related with the speed of the CPU. So if the speed is uh, very fast and you do one microsecond, you are affecting many clock cycles, and then uh, it will, um, yeah, uh, probably you will kill the chip or crash the, 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 the chip. So normally it's related with the CPU speed, but it's more in the, in the range of nanoseconds, like uh, 60 nanoseconds to, I think, the longest I have seen is one microsecond or one microsecond and a half. Okay, I actually wonder how long, if you, how long you need to do the experiment, glitching it many times in a row before you actually have a success. Are we talking half a minute or a day? Or uh, I would have uh, to so spend. the experiments that I showed you, these percentages, they, they are obtained after running a few days, typically. So yeah, you, you turn it on before you go home, uh, you leave it running over the night, you come back, you see your results, and then based on your results, you change your parameters and you iterate this process like three or four times and then you're successful. So you need five days to find the real parameters. So how, how much time do you need to glitch, where, and uh, what is the voltage? And then when you repeat these parameters, you have a high successful rate. So then you can glitch it maybe in less than one minute. So you have to try less than 100 times, and then you will have a glitch. So less than one minute or two minutes. Um, do I understand correctly that you reset the system between these attempts? Uh, yes, useful, because uh, sometimes the glitch affects some modules that you are not aware of. So do you think that the CPU is working properly after glitch? But uh, some hardware model has been affected, and then it's better to have a, a full glitch, sorry, a full reset, uh, before continuing glitching. But it depends. Sometimes we do, sometimes not, but uh, useful, yeah. For example, in this demo, it takes about three seconds to completely boot the device. So then I only reset when either I, I stopped getting responses or I was successful. And uh, every attempt, if, if nothing seems to happen, I just keep shooting and not resetting. But next time, the next boot, everything might change quite a bit, right? I mean, the timing or different things happen. It should not. It well, you, you have to find a, a trigger point which is close to where you actually want to do your fault ejection. You can't just start counting from boot time, so yeah. Um, before you said there was only one glitch and not two in those two um, processors in the, the lock step. So how can you be sure of that? Or how can you count how many glitches there were? No, no, we inject a glitch. With our tools, we say to our tools, inject a glitch. And we were expecting, because there is two CPUs, we were expecting to have to inject two glitches separated by two clock cycles. Uh, but we found out that one single glitch is enough. I don't know if this answers your question. OK. OK, one more. <laughs> Could it be that you actually glitched the comparator? Could which, be. And uh, that, that actually give you the result? It could be, but I don't think so. The reason is because the comparison is combinational logic, so you can affect it, but immediately uh, we'll get the previous value. It could be, but I think it's not very likely. But could be. We don't know, because we don't have the internal uh, 
I don't know. This, we don't know how it works internally, the chip. If there are no more questions now, you have the village, you have yeah. to talk tomorrow. Yes, maybe I can mention up. that if you want to see the demo more closely, you can also come down to the village and it will be running there. Okay, and then please give one more thanks to this awesome talk and to our speakers. <laughs>